Now, since the last federal election, Josh Frydenberg has had more to do in the face of crisis after crisis than any other modern-day Treasurer. His bushfire support and recovery packages were massive. His job keeper, job seeker and job maker stimulus a generational first. And then there was the tech giant revolt over news content. The Treasurer became the Facebook whisperer and negotiated a successful peace with the very powerful Mark Zuckerberg. But I bet you didn't know Josh Frydenberg never wanted to be a politician. In fact, he didn't even want to finish school. His aspirations were confined to one international sport. But they say he's now destined to walk in as the next Australian Prime Minister. We will see. I caught up with Josh on his couch in his electorate office in Hawthorne, Melbourne. Josh Frydenberg, thank you very much for your time. Great to be with you, Chris. I've just looked around at your office, fantastic new office since December, and some great history. You are a history buff, aren't you? Well, in order to know where you're going, you need to know where you come from. And here in Kuyong, there's a really proud history. I feel very privileged and honoured to be the seventh member since Federation. And greats like Sir Robert Menzies and Andrew Peacock, between them, held the seat for 60 years. Very proud. I want to go back 12 months ago, which is when you made up your mind that you would create the greatest wage subsidy this country has ever seen, totally unlike any other Conservative government, something you'd expect out of a Labor government more than most. What was the, Can you remember the turning point when you were juggling this around, yes, no, maybe, and then it actually hit you that you had to do it because of where we were at in terms of the pandemic. What was that turning point? Well, I think those very graphic images of thousands of our fellow Australians lining up outside Centrelink and the fear that came across the whole of the country. People didn't know if they were going to hold their job for another 24 hours. It's like a like scene out of the 30s, wasn't it? Well, there were memories of the Great Depression and people were talking in those similar terms. And the Prime Minister, myself, and the rest of the government were very focused on ensuring that we could stabilise the economic fallout. We still didn't know how everything would transpire, but we went to Treasury, we worked with the tax office, and eventually I took to the Expenditure Review Committee a proposal for a $1,500 a fortnight uh, wage subsidy. Uh, and it really has been an economic lifeline for mm. the nation. At its peak, supporting 3.6 million of our fellow Australians, nearly 1 million businesses. And it helped keep that formal connection, Chris, between employer and employee, so that when the health restrictions were eased, confidence came back, customers started coming back through the door, that business would have their employees intact. Have there been times in the last incredible 12 months where you would have preferred to have taken up your role as a professional tennis player, as you wanted to do in year 12, as you insisted your parents should allow you to do? Has it got that tough when you've thought, this is for, this is for someone else? Well, I mean, tennis is a great love of mine still, um, but I've quickly found out that my ambitions were far greater than my talents. <laughs> and uh, I wasn't going to be able to make a, a successful career out of it. I tried. Not many people know this. You insisted that your parents allow you to travel the world and play tennis. You weren't going to university. Uh, I, I, I didn't. I deferred it for a year. Um, but and, and then when they said... I didn't you, even want to finish school, to be honest. And then when they said to you, no, you will not do that, <laughs> you, didn't you protest at that? Well, what happened is that... Like any kid who stays up late at night to watch McEnroe Lindell in a French Open final, I just dreamt of being on the circuit. And I did want to leave school and my parents said, no, you're not doing that. And my dad's a surgeon, my mother's a psychologist, my sister's a paediatrician. There's a great focus on education in my family and uh, they didn't want me to leave school early. So I reached a pact with my parents. I'd finish year 12, but then I could follow my dream. And that dream dream meant that I would travel the world playing different tennis tournaments. A gap year. A gap year. And that was a wonderful experience. Uh, plenty of losses, a few wins. But again, there was a, a point of reality uh, at the end of that year, which was I was better off for my long-term prospects going to university. But at university, I was a bit distracted, Chris. I ended up playing a heap of tennis and got the wonderful opportunity to represent Australia twice 
at two World University Games, uh, first in Sheffield in the United Kingdom in 1991, and then in Buffalo in the United States in 1993. Listen to your passion. Listen to your passion. That's my real passion. You talk <laughs> about this more than you talk about the growth numbers. This is quite extraordinary. <laughs> but having said that, you go on to do honours in economics. You get scholarships to Yale and Oxford. You were meant to be the treasurer of Australia, weren't you? I don't think anyone is meant for a particular role. I, I certainly I loved my education. I was very grateful for the opportunities not only to go to uh, Oxford but also to, to Harvard. Um, they were great institutions. So too was Monash, uh, which is also close to my heart. And now I feel uh, very privileged to be serving with Scott Morrison in his government as the Treasurer of Australia, particularly given the economic challenges that we face. But you have taken on those economic challenges and made them just hum at the moment in terms of those numbers. We know about growth, we know about unemployment, um, we know about spending. It's all come back, it's looking so good. What's the next aspiration for you? Do you want to be Prime Minister one day? Look, I think everyone wants to be uh, as, as best as they can, uh, do as best as they can in the roles that they get. You wouldn't turn down a Prime Ministership though? I'm very happy in the role that I'm at. Now, but later on, would yeah. you take on the Prime Minister's I, role? I, I'm not going to speculate about that. What I'm going to say is that I love being the Treasurer. I love serving uh, in the Morrison government. Which you couldn't be the Prime Minister. Well, <laughs> I'll leave all that commentary to you. I can just tell you one thing, that if you look at my past in politics, uh, it's about being a loyal member of the team, whether it was with Tony Abbott, whether it was with Malcolm Turnbull, and now it is with Scott Morrison. Um, it's a great privilege to be his deputy. We have a really uh, good working relationship. There's a great deal of trust between us. Um, I think he's led this country wonderfully well through a really difficult time. And you're right, the economy is performing better than even we expected on our most optimistic forecasts. Uh, during the peak of the crisis. Treasury said to me that the unemployment rate could reach as high as 15 per cent and as you know it came in as at 6.4 per cent last month. So what we are seeing is a very resilient labour market. Can you get that unemployment rate down to four? Because if it got to four you've virtually got full employment haven't you? Well our goal is to get it back to where it was pre-pandemic. In February of last year it was 5.1 per cent, today it's 6.4 per cent. Four would look better. <laughs> Again, the lower the better, but this is not an easy business. And the key focus for us is to prevent what is called, in an economic term, scarring of the labour market. Mm. And I looked at previous recessions in Australia, particularly the 80s and the 90s, and it took a long time to get the unemployment rate back to where it started pre-recession. So in the 1990s, Chris, it took a full decade to get the unemployment rate back from where it started. We're now moving at probably three times that pace and it took 15 years to get the unemployment rate for younger people back to the rate it was before the but, recession. But back then there was no massive wage subsidy. This is, these are different circumstances. Will the spending of a wage subsidy as it was in its incredible form, will it eventually pay back, do you think? Well, in terms of the, the government um, paying back the debt, if, you, if that's yep. what you mean, of course, um, that is our intention to grow the economy, to balance the books and, uh, and to see the debt repaid over time. But let's not forget the context in which we're operating. This is the biggest economic shock since the Great Depression. And Australia has outperformed all other major advanced economies over the course of the last 12 months. We saw the economy of the United Kingdom contract by 9.9 per cent. We saw uh, Japan and Germany and Canada significant falls as well and of course the United States. Yet here in Australia we have contracted by just 2.5 per cent which has seen us outperform the rest brilliant, of the world. Brilliant, without a doubt. In the middle of all of that, if the challenges of bushfire recovery, COVID, uh, the pandemic coupled with the economy hasn't been enough for you, you've also lost weight. Now, that would be one of the greatest challenges, having gone through this period myself at the moment. I've lost six kilos. Is your loss bigger than mine? I think your loss is bigger than mine. Um, but I, you've done well. But I, I actually have just been eating a bit more responsibly. Um, my mother's been in my ear. Oh, it's her. Well, over the break, um, uh, they have a beach, uh, a beach house in a place called Lawn, and I went, uh, I went there with my family. 
Uh, and she waved the finger at you? On a daily basis. Yeah. Not, uh, but but in, a, in, in, a, in a positive way. Mm. In a positive way. In an encouraging way. Uh, with a bit of love and, and care for it's her work. son. You should write a book about these. <laughs> they, they sell bestsellers on this stuff. But, but Chris, hang on. Um, you know, one swallow doesn't make a summer. I don't know what's around the corner. Yeah, I had a chocolate today. Who knows? I oh, see. So you've <laughs> let yourself go. Talk about your mother. I've gone wild. Your mother, your mother escaped the Holocaust. And we hear that of a lot of people, the Hungarians, the Polish, yeah. others. From the stories that she's told you, how close did she come to not escaping the Holocaust? Well, any Jew who went through the Holocaust had their life endangered. Fortunately, uh, she and her and her family made their way to Australia, which they are forever grateful for. They got a wonderful new start here in Australia. Um, my grandfather, they had a, a small apartment in Bondi. He eked out a living by putting holes in, a belt, in belts and, and selling them. And uh, my mother got a good education. She's now a psychologist contributing back to the community. Uh, and, she, uh, and she did escape that you know, torturous, terrible period in world history. Uh, and it's a period that we should never forget because we all must say never again. Mm. And as the years pass, Chris, the survivors more and more are lost to us. And it's important that their memories, their testimonies are perpetuated. Can we do more about that? Can we do more in terms of memorials in this country? Well, one initiative that I'm really proud of is that the Morrison government is investing in partnerships with state governments right around the country, whether they're Labor or Liberal um, governments, to put in place Holocaust museums so that that memory can be perpetuated and that, importantly, younger people mm. get the opportunity to walk through these museums and understand about that tragic period in the past. Because Dwight Eisenhower, US president, but before then, the commander of the Allied forces in the Second World War, when he came upon a concentration camp in 1945, he said there'd come a time when the world and people across the world would deny that those events ever happened. And it's so important to ensure that people understand the real facts of that time. I want to talk about borders. Mm -hmm. You've spoken critically of Daniel Andrews, the fact that he was very quick to close borders and even recently with the five day lockdown was just disproportionate to what was required. Queensland of course had this 28 day period of no community transmissions which came out of nowhere. Um, of course if there's a sneeze in Brisbane, Mark McGowan will close down WA pretty quickly as well. What was the problem with those three individuals? Was it their politics? Anastasia Palaszczuk, Daniel Andrews, Mark McGowan or was it their personality deficiencies, the fact that they were, they were risk averse, that made them do what they did to the economy? Well Chris, as you know, the politics of this has been that their popularity has increased off the back of these border closures, but the impact both on a, in economic terms but also uh, the personal tolls that it's had on, on people have been actually quite profound. That being said, with the rollout of the vaccine there is now going to be greater certainty I think about the need and the ability to keep those borders open. And therefore, like Gladys Berejiklian says, it's not about infections, it's about, it's about who's in hospital, right? Well, Gladys Berejiklian has been the gold standard, New South Wales has been the gold standard in the way that they've responded to outbreaks of new cases. They've quickly um, contained those cases, they've been uh, contact testing and tracing, uh, and despite the challenges New South Wales has has encountered, for example, on the northern beaches, they haven't had a statewide lockdown. And that's a real credit to New South Wales. And as a third of the national economy, that's also been important to our economic recovery. I want to talk about Mark Zuckerberg talking to Josh Frydenberg. And you have become the Facebook whisperer, of course, because you solved that. That was thrown at you as well. Um, was there a time when Mark Zuckerberg was on the phone to Josh Frydenberg yelling and screaming and carrying on like a lunatic because he can be a little bit out of control. No, he wasn't. Um, he wasn't? No. The, the Were you? No, I wasn't. It was um, calm. The, the discussions at all times were constructive, productive and polite. Uh, I mean, there were points of directness, of course, as well. For example, after Facebook wiped out Australian news from their platform, 
without any prior warning to the Australian government, I made it very clear to him that not only were, uh, were I and the Prime Minister and our government disappointed in what Facebook did, but we were disappointed in the way they did it. Yeah. It was punishment. Well, as you saw, the reaction from across the country was very firm and very quick. And there was condemnation of, of that because you saw the Bureau of Meteorology, you saw 1800 Respect, you saw New South Wales Fire and Rescue. Outrageous. You saw a whole series of charities and not-for-profits and even government websites that were distributing information about the vaccine rollout all wiped off from the Facebook platform overnight. So what got you over the line? Well, I think at the end of the day, we reached an agreement um, that gave them some clarity and some confidence that the code would be workable. And from our perspective, we also encourage them to reach commercial deals with the partners. And as we've seen already, Channel 7 has reached a letter of intent with Facebook. Um, there are other discussions that are well underway right now. And Google, which is a larger company, uh, has reached agreements. You needed Google to make that move news. before Zuckerberg's negotiations. Well, they were very difficult conversations as well, just as I had yeah. a dozen plus conversations. But Google create the, created the precedent for you, didn't they? Well, it helped create the momentum yep. for the ultimate outcome. Mm. But they were difficult negotiations, both in the case of Google and Facebook, Chris. Mm. They said that they were going to leave, um, in the case of Google, leave Australia. And in the case of Facebook, you know, take Australian news content off permanently. OK, so apart from the diet, apart from coronavirus, apart from all of this and Facebook and everything, on comes the Aged Care Royal Commission. Serious topic. As challenging as anything you have taken, do you think you can convince the public to accept an increase in the Medicare levy to never allow the elderly to be abused again? With respect to a levy, that is one of the recommendations and the Commission has had different approaches. Um, as you know, we are a party of lower taxes. That's been our record and that will continue to be what we demonstrate. So, so it is or it isn't on the well, table? I, I'm, I'm not going to... Talk about sit on the fence. Well, no, you no. get splinters doing that. No, no, no. No, no, no. I'm not going to reveal the, um, the, uh, the outcomes of our deliberations right here, Chris. OK, but it's still possible. Well, Chris, as I've said clearly, we are a party of lower taxes. The way to meet the increased expenditure for whether it's the NDIS or the aged care bill or other areas across the economy is to grow the economy. OK, but if you got the opposition on board for a levy, it wouldn't be seen as a tax increase. It would be seen as a wonderful bipartisan effort to save the elderly. Well, the key is the outcome. Yeah. The key is what changes are going to be made it's in aged care. And it's not just about new financial commitments. It's also about improved safety improved governance, an increased workforce because we've got an ageing population. So there are many issues in addition to the increased financial commitments that are going to be required, whether it's for home care packages or whether it's for residential care. Okay. Thank you very much for your time. It's a great pleasure to be with you. Thanks, Chris. Fantastic.